Good morning, everybody. Chodesh Tov to everybody in our continuing exploration and trying our best to understand Davon Amalek, the grandfather of Mashiach, and as Dr. Friedman likes to say, the only man eligible to lead the ultimate benching at the end of time, the only man that's not disqualified. But to get into the other mood, on the way here this morning, I saw a beautiful thing. Everybody asks this question. When the month of Adar comes in, you have to add on with Simcha. So in Annapolis, we hold, or by Weisblum, Shlita has Paskin, that the more you talk about King David, that makes the people in the shul name David happy, and that's Marba Basimcha. But this morning, I saw another Marba Basimcha that was beautiful, and it just showed me more and more how the communities of Baltimore, Silver Spring, and Annapolis have to get more involved together. We can all give to each other and learn from each other. So this is a, a gift from Baltimore to Annapolis, and I'll carry back from you to them. I was davening next to a friend of mine, and a man came over, a Hashiva person, an important person, he was upset. Why did you let that guy take your seat? So the guy says, don't worry about it. But that guy, such a chutzpah person, he took your seat, you said every day, why did you let him do that for? And the guy looks at him, and he says to him with a smile, Forget about it. Mi shenechnas adar marbim besimcha. Adar is not a time to make a big stink about seats. Marbim besimcha. We don't quibble over seats. What's the big deal? So the other guy calmed down. And I got to tell you the best part. The name of the man that made this statement, his name is Yaakov Simcha. That really is the guy's name. So it just was so beautiful to see a man named Yaakov Besimcha say, Misha Nechnas Adar Marban Besimcha. And just as a reminder, maybe that's the best way, because everybody struggles. What's the Simcha I'm supposed to add on? In Yeshiva, we used to have funny signs up every day. What's the Simcha that's going to add to Adar and get ready for Purim? So Yeshiva guys would put up chocolate bars, Slurpees, all kinds of funny things. Some guys would put Torah or Yayin. But it could be learning how to get along better with people. Maybe this is the best simcha of all. And certainly Dov and Amalek is going to lead us the way. Now there's a Radak. And this is, now, I, I, now you know, Rabbi Weinschleet, I know I quote him every week, I should send him a check. But, uh, actually I did. But anyway, you know, Rabbi Wein has a statement. You know, people who don't make waves, okay? Goyim or Jews, people who don't make waves, people who only say things to make everybody happy, they're not really successful, and they never get anything done. Rav Weinschleet says, if you go through history, you know what, uh, people who were not controversial and always were, you know, being kissy-kissy to everybody, they really didn't accomplish a whole lot. The people who accomplish are those that make a tumble. That's the way it is, if you look back. You hear that? And, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and that's, that's the way it is. So the Radak, I remember, the Radak lived a long time ago, but as Rav Nutta Greenblatt Schlita from Memphis says, oh, he never died. He never died. As long as we learn his svarim, Rav David Kimchi, he's not dead. He's not dead. Uh, that, that, that story I'll tell you another time. But uh, the Radak, you know, he didn't have an agenda. And he makes a statement. And it's a statement that could upset. It'll make some people very happy, and it is going to upset people. But the Radak said it, I didn't say it, and he wasn't aiming it at anybody. I'm borrowing from the beginning of the David and Malach Shmuel story. Hashem tells Shmuel Hanavi, this show business, King Show, your man from King Show is not working out so well. I need you to go get me a new king. And I want you to go get Lee Melech. That's exact words in the Torah. You could look it up. Now, Dr. Singerman had a great idea. The next few months or years, as long as we're working on Shmuel together as a team, you, it really would be good for everyone on their own to learn up as much as Shmuel, Aleph, and then Bet uh, as they can, so that'll make us all be able to learn and share, uh, share better. So as they say, Dr. Singerman, ha-chacham barosho. The wise Singerman has his eyes in his head. I know that doesn't sound that complimentary, you know, but it is, it is, it is. Okay? All right, I mean, you'd rather have your eyes behind your glasses, but, but it is a compliment, it is a compliment. 
So here is what the Radak says. Hashem says, Shmuel, go anoint Li Amalek. Says the Radak. And everybody likes the Radak, okay? He doesn't belong to any political party in Israel, America. He's, he's, a, straight, he's a straight down the line. He says, it doesn't say go make Li Israel, go get the Jews a king. No, says the Radak. Shmuel wasn't told, go get a king, Livne Israel. Hashem says, get one for me. Now, says the Radak, what does that mean? Shmuel, I want a king that's going to listen to Avodati. His main thing is to do my Avoda. That's the top of his agenda. And the Radak Slashon is V'yishom Eilai L'chol Asher Atzavenu He is going to listen to me to all that which is commanded. He will understand. He works for me. He doesn't work for the people. And never mind what the people say. Now we're not looking to step on the people. David and Malach we're going to see today he did pretty well with the people anyway. But Hashem says never mind a populist or, 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 or a baby kisser or a handshake or, or uh, I, li- I like guys, I like David vote for David. No, no, no. Hashem says I want a king that understands he works for me. He does what I say is right. The people like it. Good. They don't like it, well, they're going to have to figure out how to like it. And Hashem says, that's what I want, because Shaul Amalek says, Radak, nice try, but he just didn't cut it. And of course, as Dr. Freeman points out to me several times a month, there was a lot of problems when Shmuel Hanavi brought Shaul in there. There were a lot of problems, big understanding, with the Jews just doing it to copy the Goyim, how much is a mitzvah is it to have a king anyway, Machlok et Tanoim, Dr. Friedman filled me in on, but Hashem says, no, 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 no. This one, this one has to be right. But it's just a powerful thing for any leader to have in their head. Yeah, yeah, you, you work for the people, you love the people. But Hashem says, remember number one, you work for me. You work for me. Because here's your choice. You could work for Hashem and know you're doing the right thing. And if the people get upset, so you find a way to explain it to the people. But if you think you work for the people and you're going to do what they want and then try to explain to Hashem what you did, that's not going to work so well, you know? Because people go away and they live so long and they die. God isn't going anywhere, okay? Now this is from the Radak, which is, this is the, it's just the great thing about the Radak is like there's no agenda. He's telling you this is what he's saying. Lamashal, on Shabbat, we were very, very privileged. Rav Nassim Friedman Shlita, Rav Nassim Friedman Shlita has to be probably one of the greatest teachers on the planet. His father, uh, I don't know how well you know the D.C. area. Do you remember in D.C.? Uh, he's still there. There's a Rabbi Clavin. There was a Rabbi Clavin. There was a Rabbi Clavin before. The Clavin family is hachi chashuv. This is so important. When my Rebbe, Rav Rudiman Zatzal, wasn't feeling well, Rabbi Clavin would come in from D.C. to be the Magid Shir. So to be a substitute teacher for Rabbi Ruderman, you got to be big stuff, okay? So the Clavin family has that Masorah, they're still around, and Rever- there's, there's a Reverend Friedman that for many, many years was the Shamish, but he could have been the rabbi. It's a tremendous Sadiq. He was a Holocaust survivor, and when you meet him, you get a little bit frightened. Small man, but he walks with a limp because one leg is bent like this. Why? He was a Hungarian concentration camp, and he was on a death march. The Nazis knew the Allies and Gil were coming, so he made them march and march and march. You know, a lot of people died, but Reverend Freeman, so uh, 520 years, he lived through it. He lived through it, but his leg is bent permanently. Nothing the doctors could do. So his son, Harav Nassim Freeman, and I'll tell you the truth, maybe you know another child of his, only Marilyn, only Marilyn. There's a wonderful rabbi, <laughs> Rabbi Shia Milikovsky. Rabbi Shia Milikovsky's wife, Sabina, so she's Rabbi Freeman's sister. Both all the way back from D.C. So anyway, Rav Nussin Freeman was speaking about a Kliyakar. A Kliyakar. I'm sure the rabbis quoted the Kliyakar. And he was learning out from last week's Parsha about if a Jew wants to be wealthy, Zolzan, you can be wealthy. But don't be ostentatious. Don't show it off, because every time Jews show off their wealth, we get in trouble. 
all kinds of trouble, all kinds of trouble. And in the Kli Yakar, he makes it very clear that he has an agenda. Now, he lived a few hundred years ago. So you're wondering, you know, what kind of car would he drive? What, what, what were they doing then? What kind of boat? Whatever it was. But he says, I am talking to these Jewish people that I see that they're doing this. And they're making trouble with us with the nations. The nations think we're stealing their money. And, 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 and he has a very, very specific agenda. And I think I think anyone who, who reads it would say, well, you know, the news still applies. Now, the Klee Yucker said what had to be said, whatever, 300 plus years ago, but he had a definite agenda. Nothing wrong with that. Klee Yucker was a holy, holy man. But I must tell you, the Radak, what the Radak says, you know, can be a little offensive to people, but he doesn't care. He sa- he works for God, you know? He's the- he doesn't want to say what's uh, popular with the people. He tells it like it is, and he- there was no target agenda. He's explaining the Pasuk with his Ruach HaKodesh. This is a very, very powerful statement. So when David and Melech gets in there, we have to remember, no matter what King David does, whether we understand him or not, we have to remember, he is the one Hashem said on him, Lee Melech, that red-haired fella whose great-grandmother was Rus, who people couldn't figure out if her Judaism was kosher, think what you want, says God, but Lee Melech. That's my boy. That's my Melech. So we just got to keep that in mind, and even though there's going to be plenty of questions, there's even going to be one today, just keep that in mind with, with, uh, with our Dovina Melech. And he definitely, definitely worked for Hashem. There's a beautiful Gemara in Brachot. Now, um, rabbis do a lot of, I think rabbis' hard work is really off the pulpit. I think you realize that. But one thing rabbis do, and very, very much in private, is, and we don't talk about it that much, he definitely doesn't get up and shawl and talk about it, but what a rabbi has to do, for shul members that are the right age and travelers that come through, is... There's mikvah questions. There's very, very, very private mikvah questions that a doctor cannot answer with all his brilliance. A do- the best doctor can't answer these questions. And halakha, we have certain mikvah questions and dam questions of physical biology, hilchas tum and tara. So only a rav like Rabbi Weissman, not all rabbis can handle it. Rabbi Weissman can handle it. Now you're not going to know about this, but... You know, uh, husbands, usually not the woman, usually a husband will go in privately with the rub and he'll show him this or that, and the rabbi will take a look at it and he'll tell him what the halach is. Go back to the mikvah, don't go back to the mikvah, wait a few days, whatever it is. Not every rabbi can handle it. I am proud to say that I have a son, Rabbi Naftali Karp, and I know you don't believe I have a son old enough for this, but I just turned 55. I have a son in his 30s, he has the smicha that he could pask in these shilas. He drove to Muncie to a wonderful rabbi named Rabbi Shabbos many, many, many times, and the rabbi showed him all the different kinds of blood and everything. It's called Shimush, that my son got, uh, got this, uh, this ability to learn how to do it. You have to know some science, you have to know some medicine, and boy, you've got to know halacha and you need experience. The so his father still does that as well. That's right. Yep. Now, where you really get in trouble is one of my rebbies has been a shul rabbi since he's been around 25, and he knows how to pask in these shilas, but he can't do it. He's colorblind. So let me just say a little bit about America. I don't know if in Eretz Yisrael you have this. In Woodbridge, it's not Lush and Hari, he, he, he jokes about it. In, in Woodbridge, New York, there's a wonderful rabbi named Rabbi Heshi Goodman Shlita. He's my rabbi. He, he's up there in his 80s. Wonderful Rav can help you with whatever you want, but women questions he can't answer because he's colorblind. Now that's rough. What is a rabbi going to do in a little town in the Catskills? Put in Shiloh. You're a Rav in a small town. You've got to know how to do everything. <coughs> Hang in there. A little bit over is a place called Woodburn, New York. And for many, many years, Woodburn, New York, the Rav there, was another Rav you have a connection with, Rav Nachum Laskin, Zechlin Levracha. Guess what? Two rabbis, Rabbi Goodman in Woodridge, not far away, Rabbi Laskin in Woodburn. Now, good, Woodburn's a small town, Rabbi has to be able to do everything. Guess what? The rabbi is a kayin. He can't do the funerals. Perfect shidduch. Rabbi in Woodridge can't poskin the lady Shilas because he's colorblind. Can't see? Set him to the rabbi in Woodburn. He can say, the rabbi in Woodburn can't do the vayas, he's a kayin. 
Oh, I can't do Leviah Kor by Goodman. So the ra- and I'm not even joking. The rabbis had to steal, and that way they were able to function uh, you know, for years. They wouldn't do that. So I want to tell you about David and Melech. The Gemara says, David Melech Yisrael. The Gemara says he used to, Gemara and Brachot, he used to get his hands fashmutzed and dirty with all <coughs> kinds of dam. Now there's food around. I don't want to tell you exactly what the Gemara says because then you won't be able to eat. You can use your imagination, but don't use your imagination too much because you won't be able to eat or drink. <laughs> but the Gemara lists all kinds of bloody things that David Amalek used to stick his hands into to examine bloody clothes, but oh, 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 doctor things, whatever. And he would work really hard to tell somebody if they were Taha or Tame, if the husband and wife, or the mikvah, the whole business. That was David Amalek, okay? So it's just very important to realize this is a man that he, he works for Hashem. Aye, it's not dignified! As his own wife, Michal Bacho. Now I'm just gonna tickle you. I will not discuss it, cause one of our Gedole Hador, Rav Herschel Schachter, already handled it, so you don't need little old squeaky flea me. David Amalek's wife, Michal Bacho, who is famous because she wore tefillin. We're not, I am not discussing it. You have any questions? Go online, find out what Marina Rabina Reversal Shachta Shlita from Margadalim dealt with it. I'm not getting involved. But Michal Bacho, who was royalty, she told off Davin Amalek when he was dancing Basimcha, right? And all right. right, you saw his legs. Yeah. She said, that's undignified for a king. But I will say one thing. I'm not getting involved in that controversy over there because that's beneath Annapolis' Torah. I just want you to know that another one of our great people, Rabbi Yisrael Reisman Shlita, Rashiva Vidas. Now, listen to this. Put this in your pipe and smoke it. He brings proof. Oh, it's an avayor to smoke. Forget that. All right. But anyway, Rabbi Reisman brings show. proof <laughs> that Michal Batshol did not wear tefillin for the reasons a lot of people think she did. He says it was a punishment for mouthing off to her husband. Now, if you like that, good. If you don't, just talk to Rabbi Reisman from Torah Vidas. He'll tell you how to get the, You know how to get Torah Vidas? Because I don't. But anyway, you'll tell him how to get the young Israel of Madison, wherever Rabbi Reisman is. All right, but back to our regular... But I'm not getting involved with that. Rabbi Schefter, your friends are Rabbi Herschel Schefter. I don't want to get started with that. never had any children either. Oh, Micha. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a bad end. You got it. It's got to be in the book, Doc. Got to be in the book. So Micha Bacho says to David Amalek, that's undignified for a king to dance like that in front of the maids. That's right. But David Amalek doesn't care. Luich Patlo. I work for him. And if this is what I hold, if dancing like this, forgetting the Iron Kodesh is back, it's undignified to the people, the reporters are going to write something about me. CNN Lies is going to write something about me. That's not, that's fake Yiddish. But anyway, I don't care. I work for the king. I work for God. I do what God says. So in the Gemara and Brachis, when David and Malach got his hands filthy and gooey, handling dam and other things from women, Someone could say, it's passionate that that's not right for the king. Uh-uh. I am working for God. And if helping a married woman figure out if she's time to marry or to hire her to spend time with her husband, I don't care what it does to me. Who cares what it does to me? I work for the king. Now, he wasn't a slob. The halacha is, Melech mistaper b'chol yom. A king has to get a haircut every day except for Shabbat because he has to look marvelous. Uh, you know, a uh, kind of pretty frequent too, but not that frequent. David Amalek knew the lines, but I'm just stressing over here. He had his mind, I work for God, I'm doing what God wants me to do, the people like it, good. If they don't, I'll talk to them later. I'll talk to them later. I'm not Democrat, Republican, I'm Godican. You know, that's what, and that's what it is. All right, now, it's very close to Purim, so therefore, Rav Weisblum figured that we really should jump over to Perak Lamed. Now, David is not Melech yet, but over here we have David and Melech fighting our arch enemy Amalek. Amalek. This is the month when we think about fighting Amalek more than any other month. 
and we must remember that any battle will on Molik. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole thing of Svi, are you really sure Haman was related to Amalek? Are you sure Hitler was related? Are you sure Helen Thomas Shemach Shemav Zichra from Wayne State? Yeah, uh, we could talk. I have, I, have a, I have a dog in that fight. <laughs> anyway, so uh, anyway, you really sure they're related? Are you really sure they're Amalek? Are you sure Saddam and Sain and all them? Says your Salavashik Shlit, uh, Zatzal. Beshem his father of Maisha Salavashik Zatzal. In the name of many, many post scheme, when it comes to wiping out Amalek Lahalacha, it doesn't have to be that they have the same DNA. Right. Okay? Uh, some people make that mistake that you have to have the same DNA as Amalek, and no, maybe we shouldn't have, maybe we should be like the Christians and turn the other cheek, uh, not hate Hitler so much. There's something so good to say in Yiddish, but this is a video, so I can't say it. I'll just say, Zeichen Kushen Epis. We'll leave it at that. So we're not going to be like those Christians, all right? We're not gonna, we're not gonna, God bless the Christians. God bless the Christians. They should get along with us. But we're not turning the other cheek on Hitler. But Rav Salavich, okay. the father and the son, bring many, many riots that when you see someone that acts like an enemy of God and Judaism... You don't gotta check their DNA chromosomes. That's a Amalek. You act like an Amalek, that's what you are. The only frightening part is we have to remember is that, as the famous Yiddish saying, Divas Kristelzich, Yiddelzich, I said it wrong, but anyway, that, you know, whatever the Goyim are into, we get into whether we like it, when we, we like it or not. But if there's a lot of Amalek out there, we Jews are affected also. And unfortunately, we do know there are Jews that act like Amalek. Yes. So whenever you're dealing with Amalek, there's a physical fight and there's a spiritual fight. They're not just out to shoot us to kill us. They're out to kill on the Shama. They're out to kill Judaism and revealing a Kaddish Baruch Hu in the world. That's the, my brother, Rabbi Hanan Wiener from Eishatel Rav Boston, told me he gets complaints every year from Jewish boys and girls in college, and they come to him. I wrote a term paper, and the term paper was not critical enough of Israel, so my teacher either failed me or gave me a bad grade. Could you imagine? Uh, my brother said this is very common. It doesn't happen just in Boston. And the sad part is a lot of times the professors are Jewish. So you have a left wing, I hope it doesn't go again, a left wing Jewish professor who will mark a Jewish boy or girl a bad grade or worse because they wrote something positive about the state of Eretz Israel and they're knocking them. So that's a Bissell Jewish Amalek, so that's just a little bit scary that even though our main enemy is the, the Gentile world that acts like Amalek, but sometimes it can creep into Jews also. And of course, my dear wife likes to remind ourselves that we have to watch it because sometimes Amalek can even creep into ourselves. So you have to watch out for that. So anyway, this is what happens. Now, David and Melech had had some encounters with Amalek already. Now, David is not the king just yet. Right now, he's on the outs with Shaul and Melech. Things aren't going so well. They're having some problems. And David and Melech is busy with some diplomacy with a guy named Ochish Melech Gas. Thank you. Fellow named Ochish Melech Gas, David and Melech, thank you very much is developing a relationship with him, a diplomatic relationship, which he hopes will have long-term good effects for the Jewish people. So, he had had some clashes with Amalek already, and then, here we come to a mistake of David. He wasn't trying to hurt anybody. It was a military mistake, and Gil can tell us that this is a mistake that happens in modern times just as well with all our experience in technology. David and Melech took a whole bunch of men and he went to hang out with Achish Melech Gas. There were supposed to be some maneuvers, but David made a mistake. Achish Melech Gas had given David and his men a town called Siklag. Siklag, okay? 
and that's where the, the Jews, their wives and kids were supposed to stay. That's where they were supposed to live for a while. When David Melech and his men went to help out Achishmelech Gas, they made a military mistake. They did not leave the town properly guarded. It was not properly guarded. I don't know why. Maybe they thought they weren't going to be too long. Whatever it was, it was a mistake. And I'm sure Gil knows many, many cases where people thought, all right, we'll leave a few people. doesn't have to be guarded so well. It'll be okay. Nothing to worry about. And you come back, the worst. Well, this is what happened. David and Melech and his buddies, they come back to Tzitklag after the visit of Achish Melech Gas, and they realize that they made a terrible, terrible mistake because Amalek came to visit. Amalek burned down the town, captured all the women and children, and they made off with them. Now, all the Mephoshim point out that this Amalek, throughout history, always has the same trait. He's a coward, and he punches the low punch. We all know, whether you've been in boxing or wrestling or not. I wonder how much boxing Bruce was in. But we all know that in the sport of boxing and wrestling, there are rules. There are certain punches that are illegal. We all know that, okay? We all know that. I'm not discussing mixed martial arts. We don't talk about that. Because <laughs> Gil's going to tell us very scary stories. And we're not going to get on. I'm talking about regular sports, okay? Don't be insulted. Don't be insulted. So anyway, so Amalek doesn't play fair. From the first time they started up with us in the, in the Chumash, throughout any other place in the Torah, Amalek will wait for an opportunity. They're cowards. And they will start up with old people, weak people, women and children, and they don't really want to fight like a man face to face, and here they did it again. You wait till David and Malak's group is helping out another nation over there, ah, go after the women and children and burn down the place. So it's cowardice, absolute cowardice. All right. David and his men come in, and they are absolutely <laughs> heartbroken, and you don't need the Mephorshim, you don't need the explainers to tell you the main heartbreak is not the town being burnt down, their possessions, it's the women and children being taken away, who knows what's going to be with them. Now, I told you at the onset that we weren't going to whitewash anything. So, oh, David HaMelech, the fearless leader of this group, who's trying to do the right thing for his group, he gets in a lot of trouble. His men tell him right out, what kind of leader are you? We did not leave sufficient defenses over here. Now, of course, we could talk another time. America is also very, very good at not leaving sufficient defenses in times of war because we all know during the War of 1812, President James Madison, who without him... May he rest in peace. We might not be able to have a shul. He was not the greatest general, but as far as getting freedoms and having shuls and freedom of this and that, he was pretty good. So we all know Washington wasn't guarded very well during the War of 1812. The British came, they burned it down, they burned down the White House. The president had to leave early. Dolly is still there, saving this and that. All right, we talked about that once. But first, David and Malak's men. And we're not going to make David a perfect person. We're not. He was criticized. They said to David, how did you mess this up? Why did you take us over there to Achish Malach Gas? Look what happened over here. Now, we don't find, and I looked around a lot, we don't find anybody saying, David answering them back, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm the big military mind, I know what I'm doing. Guys, I looked everywhere and combed the Midrashim. I didn't see anybody say that David Abelach tried to deny his mistake in military management. Those who know military history or have dabbled in it known there are a lot of big military figures who made terrible, terrible mistakes and they will not admit they're wrong. If you want a quick case, I won't get into it now, try Googling 
Admiral Halsey from the Navy. You know how much blood is on his hands for mistakes he made? Oh, yeah. And as far as I know, with all the federal inquiries, I don't think he admitted it, okay? Robert E. Lee admitted it. You all know at Gettysburg when he didn't listen to P. Longstreet. Every single history book has the great Robert E. Lee said those magic words. It was all my fault. Shouldn't have done Pickett's charge. All right. Good man, good man. Didn't have slaves either. Uh, but David Amelech, we're going to go back to him. He didn't try to excuse himself. He blew it. He blew it. He made a military mistake. Fine. But now we got to fix it. But then it got worse. All the men sat down and were crying. Where's my wife? Where's my kids? I'm all they came. They're all crying. So David's sitting there and crying too. Two of his wives got taken away. David was crying a lot. Now listen to what happened to David and Malach. He was crying a lot. And he was crying a lot for a very human reason. You know, his family is his family has been taken away by the ruthless Amalek. He feels bad that he didn't protect the city well enough. But he's crying a lot. So the Mephorshim say that some of his friends said, Look at him! He looks like he's crying more than us. Who does he think he is to be crying more than us? He thinks he had a bigger loss than we did? So they were critical of him. So what does he do? Does he get up there and start saying all kinds of excuses? Will I have more to cry? None of that. And that's part of the greatness of David Amalek. If there's a mistake or something like that, or something imperfect, he doesn't, he doesn't get stuck in, I'm right, I'm right. doesn't do that. He takes action. But you have to understand, though, his own men over there, they were criticizing him. You messed up the defenses, and they criticized him even the way he cried. He's, oh, you're not crying the same way we are. You're, you're making like you have it worse. So what David and Malach did, and this is the way everybody learns it, He's sitting there, I'm supposed to be the big general, I made a mistake. I'm supposed to lead the people, they're mad at me. What do I do with all this? So the Pusik says, he turned towards Hashem, and he said, Hashem, I don't know what's going on over here, I don't know how I have a mistake like this, I'm afraid of a Amalek, but God, Hashem, you gotta help me. He turned all his anguish into Hashem. Hashem, guide me, help me with what to do. Now I want you to know, the Halig of Baal Shem Tev says this. He learns it out from Parshas Vayigash with Yehuda and Yosef. The Baal Shem Tev says like this. Anytime you're afraid of something, be it a Molek or someone else, you have to stop, if you can, for a moment and realize there's a spark of Hashem in the middle of whatever fearful thing is happening. He, the Baal Shem Tev says the way to deal with it is try to stop for a minute, realize Hashem is in here someplace, and you have to be able to find, say, Hashem, I don't understand this, but you're terrific, you know what you're doing, there's a reason for this, but, and I know you're going to help me out of it. So the Baal Shem Tev would say, the yeah, Rebbe talks about it also, that this is what David Amalek was doing. What could be a bigger tragedy? Your wife and kids are captured by a Amalek, and your friends are upset with you, and they're even criticizing the way you cry. The Mephorshim say, David Amalek, look to see the sparks and flames of Hashem in the situation. He turns towards Hashem. He says, Hashem, you got to get me out of this. You know what you're doing. And the Mephorshim spend a lot of time explaining why all the different things happened, David and Melech's mistake, and while he was there and why he was there. They work it all out in the big picture. So Bikisur, David and Melech is going to make sure this time the city is amply guarded. They're going to head towards Amalek, and they're going to find someone who's going to be their spy. Now, there's a beautiful, beautiful Mishnah in Tainus, based on Sukim, that says like this. When the Kohen Goro, that's you, would speak to the Jews before they went out to the army, right? Because if you have a Jewish army, you, you got to do everything right if you want success. 
You got to do it right. You got to speak to your rabbi. So he tells them, you're going out to war against your enemy. It's not the civil war in Navi where it's Shevet against Shevet. And the Kayin Gadol says, hey, when Jews fight Jews, Debuch, even if you get captured, they put you on a horse, they give you food and drink, they give you clothing. That's brother against brother. They're out to win, win an argument, not out to kill you. When you go against your enemy, there's no mercy, there's no quarter. And the Kayin Gadol reminds that when in those situations where you have to go to war, you better be ready because you're not going to get mercy from your foe over there. They find a refugee from the Amalek camp. Now really, they probably were tempted to chop his head off because this young lad over here he had been part of the Amalek force. He was an Egyptian lad. He had been part of the Amalek invasion force. But you know what happened? This is how the, the enemy treats their own. He got sick on the, when they left, when Amalek left from attacking Tziklag. He got sick. He fell down. And his people, they just left him to die. The hay with him. The hay with him. That's how, uh, that's how the world sometimes treats their own weak long week, just leave him to die. The Jews came along, they didn't really know what the guy's story was, but they gave him something sweet, they gave him, it looks like a date cake over here, and they gave him what to drink, and they took care of him, and then when he came around, they found out that he had good intelligence, and he was going to lead them to Amalek. He led them to Amalek, he got a promise out of Dovin and Melech that he wouldn't kill him. Never. The poor guy hadn't had anything in three days. And Dovin and Melech and his men, and remember, he had cut down his, his, his group size because he wanted to make sure they enough to defend the city. And they go in and they beat the living daylights out of Amalek. And now I'm going to answer a question that you're wondering. The nasty question that you nice people you don't want to ask. You say, Cock, listen, come on, Amalek. Amalek captures women and children? What must have happened to Dovid's wives? Because the Mephorshim say, Amalek was so proud. Ha ha! We got the general's wives! Oh, this is the best our trophy. Better than an Oscar, or Emmy, or a Grammy. It was what to worry about. And the Mephorshim say that when they got in there, Dovid Amalek captured his wives back with his own two fists. And that's great. It's one thing to rescue your wife, but you do it pow with your own fist and save your wife. That's really dynamic. That makes like Douglas Fairbanks and Buster Crab look like nothing, right? Or a Buzz Lightyear, whatever. But David and Malach got a prize. They were reliable witnesses that the women were not contaminated. Because that's a pretty big fright, right? Anybody captures the women, especially a Moloch, you can think of the worst. But David and Malach was able to find out that the women were not contaminated. Not that he would have thrown them away, but whatever it is. It ends on a nice note, though, just to give you a, an idea of what David, what David was like. And he stresses to the men again and again, this is not about us, it's about Hashem's helping us. They added, the battle force was only 400 men. But they took Amalek by surprise. We beat him up. We took, you know, we, we, we got rid of most of them. A few ran away, but we got rid of most of them. When they came back, they had a lot of spoils. They got back their own things. They got some things from Amalek. And David and Malach said, we're all going to share. First, they wanted to give everything to him. Because you're the mighty hero. David said, it's not about me. I work for Hashem. I work for you. We're going to share. But then some people said, wait a second, the guys, the defense force, you're going to give them? And what about the quartermasters, the people who stayed behind the lines, watching the supplies? You're going to give them as much as everybody else? And David said, yeah, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give the defense force. I'm going to give the people that were behind the lines. And you know what else? At every Jewish war, and this is the big tumult that they're always fighting about, you have to have some Jews fighting the Arabs, and you have to have some Jews saying to Helim, and you have to have a certain amount of Jews learning Torah. That's the way it works if you want God to save you, right? Now, how much you need of which you need big, uh, big rabbis, big generals for. I'm not getting involved in that, okay? But anyway, David and Malach said, listen, 
if you win the war by yourself, then you can tell me the guy with the sword gets all the booty. But he goes, that's not what happened. Hashem helped us win this Amalek, even though he's a coward. So we're going to give equal spoils to those of you who were there, those who were back defending, and those who were all the way in the back line serving Gatorade and giving out Twinkies. We're going to give to every... I want to give the guy... We're going to go to the base marriage and give the people who said, tell them and learn. We're going to... Because every single Jew, no matter what they did, they all had faith and they were important in this victory. So gentlemen, here we see just a glimpse of what Dovin and Malach is all about. We see him with the mistakes, we see how he fixes mistakes, and we see how he looks for people. But like we started with, it's very, very clear to Dovin and Malach that he may not always get it right, but he works for the big one. Thank you very much. It should be continued. Mishanech Nasadar, Marben Besimcha. Yoshikov.